It's not like I was four years old and I said, Mommy, Daddy, I want to study neural oscillations. There's this pop science view of scientists as you know, being driven since childhood to answer this one burning question or solve this one problem. But I, I doubt any actual scientist fits that mold. I think most scientists kind of start in one field or one topic and their curiosity drives them to another topic and that drives them to another topic. Or maybe they're studying one topic and they realize, oh, this is the really important question in this discipline. And then they have to uh, investigate that for a bit. So that kind of meandering also really characterizes my own career. I started my PhD studying personality psychology. So it was all uh, questionnaires and correlating, you know, self-report questionnaires with some other variables and things like that. That's uh, that's quite interesting research because that these are like the topics that everyone thinks about every day. Right? Uh, but after a few years, that felt a little bit unsatisfying. I wanted to dig a little bit deeper, so. Uh, then I switched and I started doing um, fMRI studies of learning and memory. And then I switched for various reasons to studying EEG, intracranial EEG, um, and uh, scalp EEG, measured on the head and EEG. And yeah, I guess I've kind of always um, felt like once I understand the methods of some topic, then I want to scratch a little bit deeper. So that kind of brought me to where I am now, which is systems neuroscience. Um, and basically what we're trying to do is study the electrical activity of populations of cells and try and understand how populations of cells can code information and transfer information across different populations of cells, maybe in different brain regions, using these um, electrochemical signaling. People often peg me as the oscillations guy, or sometimes even more particularly as the theta guy, Mr. Theta. Uh, and, uh, it's funny and it's fine, but the, and I know why they call me that because I wrote this book about uh, measure quantifying oscillations in data. But mostly, yeah, this goes back to what I said earlier. It's not like I was four years old and I said, "Mommy, Daddy, I want to study neural oscillations." It's more like. Uh, when you look at data, you see oscillations there. So I think, uh, yeah, you have to be driven by what's in the data. So oscillations refer to these kind of wiggles and the electrical activity uh, over time. And oscillations are a curious thing because you see oscillations everywhere in biology, everywhere in physics. Yeah, anywhere you look in a system that changes over time, you're likely to see these kinds of sinusoidal fluctuations. So uh, so what do they mean? So in the brain, oscillations refer to these kind of rhythmic fluctuations in the excitability of populations of neurons. So they're more excitable, less excitable, more excitable. Um, there's a bit of a debate in the field about how crucial oscillations really are for neural computation. Uh, at, the, at one extreme, people really believe that oscillations have a huge role in shaping the timing of computations and whether a computation can take place. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, people argue that these oscillations are just epiphenomenal, they're there, but they're not really sort of part and parcel, they're not a critical part of how the brain computes information. Uh, I guess I am a little bit, I try to be a little bit agnostic in the sense that um, in my opinion, these oscillations, so it's, it's undeniable that, that oscillations are really great um, indices for brain activity. We can look in the data, we see oscillations, uh, and these features of oscillations correlate really strongly with, uh, with behavior, with the way that people are doing the task. Uh, they correlate with age, they correlate with disease. Um, and I guess as a scientist, I try to remain at that level without kind of um, tying myself too closely to any particular theory that says that 
this oscillation is absolutely crucial for this function. Uh, and some of the modeling work actually suggests this as well, that um, yeah, depending on how you create these models, you may or may not need oscillations to uh, implement some computation for the this yeah, simulation of the brain area to perform some task. Yeah, so one of the things that uh, I even sometimes have to remind myself how amazing it is, uh, we do these time frequency analyses, spectral analyses, we look for rhythmic patterns of activity. Um, typically, the plots that we generate are one second in, in time. So we're really just zooming into one second of brain activity. And there's all these different dynamics happening across different frequencies and different regions of the brain. They become very quickly synchronized and desynchronized. They're sort of coupled together and then they spin off and do their own separate things. And I look at these plots all the time. I get so used to them, they become almost mundane. But sometimes I take a step back and think, shit, am I allowed to say shit on here? Uh, this is all happening in one second. You know, that's a tiny amount of time for, you know, our experience of, of time and consciousness and life. One second is, is very small. And we look in the data and there's so many crazy things that are happening just in one second. I think that's something that, uh, that whenever I catch myself that I stop being amazed by it, I have to remind myself that that is mind blowing. Something with neuroscience and uh, entomology, something with insects, uh, in particular um, social insects like ants, for example. And it's uh, it's it's always amazed me that these tiny, simple creatures—they don't even have brains; they just have ganglia. They manage to manifest this seemingly complicated behavior. And how do they? Why do we need such a huge brain? You know, yeah, you ask most people, they'll say, well, it's because we have very complicated behaviors and thoughts and things like that. And that's true, right? But an ant has a, you know, you could fit like a million ant brains on my finger and I wouldn't even feel the weight. And, and they figure out how to do some pretty complicated, sophisticated behaviors. So I think that would be something I would like to do. Yeah, great question. Uh, it's a valid concern. Um, I do think you need to have, so it's important to be able to string your career together along some arc, right? That can be um, uh, an arc that's about a particular question or a particular theory or a particular topic. So you can say, I'm interested in um, why people forget things when they're tired, for example. So now you can do MRI studies, EEG studies, animal models, you know, there's all kinds of ways you can study the same question. Um, I do have, so I, I do, so I don't totally jump around to completely different topics. So for the past nine or 10 years, uh, I, wait, let me think about that. Shit. No, it's been about 12 or 13 years actually. So for the past 12 or 13 years, I've been focused on frontal theta oscillations and their role in, in cognitive control. Um, so then I've studied that using a variety of different techniques. And to be totally honest, and this is not like privacy honest because I realize I'm being filmed here, but to be totally honest, uh, I, I, I have to, I feel that I need to um, constrain my research a little bit or sort of guide my research a little bit I don't want to stray too far off this topic exactly because then it looks like I'm kind of an unreliable um, researcher. Um, so, but that said, I think um, also for me, it's, it's the data analysis methods that have been an underlying current that kind of ties everything together. <laughs> uh, 
Wouldn't you like to know? 